the topic of today is uh, alcohol and youth, and what we will discuss is this report, Alcohol and uh, Society, that uh, was produced by a group of very distinguished researchers that we have here today. We are very pleased to have again here Professor Harold Holder from uh, Berkeley, but a world leading researcher and policy maker or evaluator in alcohol research, uh, and has been very helpful here to us in Sweden, alcohol research, evaluations, alcohol policy. And uh, in the report, you can get his response to the question, why on earth do you come so often to Sweden? <laughs> we also have Professor Tim Stockwell from Victoria, British Columbia, also a frequent visitor to Sweden. Um, very uh, distinguished researchers in alcohol, uh, drug-related uh, research and policy, active on Canadian and international WHO level. Uh, we're pleased that you also can come so far to help us. Uh, professor Sven Andreasson, who is a professor at the Karolinska Institute and also a um, clinical uh, medical officer working with alcohol prevention early detection at Östermalm. Uh, so uh, we will start with the presentations of you three. I don't need to advocate for the topic alcohol and youth. Just one very simple example. This has been a very nice and hot summer, but we have a double number of deaths by drowning. And you know that the majority of these are, are alcohol related. So just very simple fact reminding us of, the, of, of this hot, hot topic, literally. So. Uh, and uh, we will have the presentations by, in the following order, Harold Holder, Tim Stockwell, and Sven Andreasson uh, during 40 minutes, 35 actually, according to our schedule. So it's a very tight schedule. After that, there will be possibilities for you to address the presentations with questions, comments. And after that, we will have a more policy-oriented uh, debate a panel debate with the uh, players I just introduced. Very welcome, everybody. Uh, please, Harold. Yes, please. Is everyone here? I feel like I should sing, but you don't want me to sing. You're like a rock star or something. Tim Stockwell will sing later. Okay, that's. Okay, uh, we three are of uh, a group that uh, did this report, um, and I thought my part will be to kind of introduce the report, a little bit about it, uh, why we did it, and, uh, and then Tim and Sven will give you some more technical background, research background about some of the content on which we base some of the recommendations of the group. I thought you might be interested in how this was a topic uh, selected. Uh, this project uh, was a joint collaboration between the, the Swedish Society of Medicine and IOGT. Uh, they gave us, as a group, uh, a set of what these two groups uh, suggested would be important topics for us to consider uh, with reference to research. This is not a topic we selected, though we were interested in all the items in the list. And then we looked at the list in terms of where is the best research evidence as well as the social importance. And as Peter has already noted, um, the topic of youth drinking, youth harm, young adult. This is our high risk group for alcohol related problems uh, in acute ways. So, and there is a considerable research base on, on how to intervene with these groups and what one can do at a societal or policy level. Uh, so once we had the topic, then we began to work, and the topic, as you know from the copies of the report that you're working on, is looking at harms. Uh, we did not spend a great deal of time looking at the research evidence in Sweden, though we did some. Uh, it's very well documented, and there is a good bit of research in your own country. <clears throat> We had basically three goals, was given this topic uh, to do a rather comprehensive review of the scientific literature. What could it tell us? What didn't it tell us? What was missing? 
uh, with a particular focus on what were prevention strategies at a population level, not treatment level or early intervention level, uh, that had evidence of effectiveness in the international research uh, world that would show potential to reduce harm among uh, youth and young adults ages, we said roughly ages 15 to 25, and this is the heaviest drinking group in almost every culture in the world, uh, with a focus on specific strategies that had uh, special relevance to the Swedish uh, situation and to the Nordic uh, community at large. Uh, this is the list of uh, researchers. Uh, three of us are here. Uh, the others send their wishes, uh, but uh, they could not be here. Um, in general, a thing we knew as we began this work is that this age group is our highest group for acute harm. There is a great deal of emphasis in, in discussions around uh, long-term chronic exposure to alcohol and death, and uh, sometimes in the debate, youth and young adults are ignored. And so we thought it was very important that this topic was selected because of injuries and alcohol involvement, alcohol affecting impairment, um, violence, homicide, suicide, domestic violence, assault, ch child abuse and neglect, sexually transmitted infections, unintended pregnancies, uh, even dependency, which begins in some age groups. There is good research on age of first drink as at least a predictor of later uh, dependency and problems in school performance and even lost productivity because these uh, the young adults are in the workforce. So what is the situation for Swedish youth? Um, this is uh, a plot that you may be familiar with, which is of, uh, based on uh, CNN uh, school surveys, 15-year-olds, uh, boys and girls, top line, of course, boys, second line, girls, uh, over the period 2006, 2013, which shows a, a significant, and in some ways to be congratulated to the Swedish situation reduction, in self-reported drinking in the past 12 months. Um, so we want to acknowledge that that has occurred. However, when we look at further, this is now the older age group, and in your context and in the U.S. context, this is a very high drinking group. 17-year-olds do not show the same level of decline. But either way, even if there is real decline, the levels of drinking in these populations are for us at least, of concern. And so there we started there with a concern about not that there had been a trend, not to discount the, the positive potential of the trend downward, but that the problem still existed. Uh, this is a slide, a table from the report in which we looked at for young people uh, in the second year in gymnasium in 2012, of the drinkers, what percent of those drinkers reported things like quarrels, lost money or valuable, unprotected sex, accident or injuries, problems with relations to friends, unwanted sex, lower achievement in school, being robbed or stolen from, been to hospital. Uh, a significant percentage of young people who report drinking uh, have that. And on the other side is the approximate uh, number of young people who would be involved if we generalize this to the whole population equivalent to that age group. Uh, the mortality among uh, our age group, 16 to 24, uh, in Sweden is our understanding that death rate has increased over the past decades and this would be largely a result of acute uh, harm, acute deaths. Uh, and that alcohol is the leading risk factor for death and injury among this age group, including when you consider alcohol poisoning, violent events, and alcohol-involved traffic crashes. So in other words, we concluded this is a serious problem in this country as it is in most of the developed world, and what are things that we could recommend and what is it that the scientific research literature tells us were possible strategies that one might use. We had two kinds of recommendations. Uh, I'm not going to review the research uh, evidence. Uh, Tim and Sven will spend some time with that. 
but I'll go you, take you to the bottom for us, the takeaway message in terms of re recommendations. Uh, in, in a sense, it's a rec set of recommendations made with due respect for the Swedish situation and the history of this country and using alcohol policy to reduce harm. Uh, as Peter mentioned, I've been coming to this country now for over 25 years. Uh, I come frequently with uh, my, my uh, tuxedo expecting, just in case the Nobel Prize has been overlooked, that I would be available. But so far, that is not the case. Um, the first was the good news for us. Uh, um, what is it that we think Sweden is doing very well with reference to youth and young adults? Uh, certainly the retail monopoly, um, both restrictions on hours of sale, density, uh, point of sale, age restrictions, uh, the, the documented history of a ID checking, age checking by the monopoly is quite good, much higher, much better than retail outlets, private retail outlets, as well as restrictions on promotions and other things that bring, uh, in my country, individuals to, uh, to purchase. Um, I moved to California some years ago from, uh, from North Carolina where we have, still do, a retail monopoly and I was not prepared for having my local uh, food shop sell alcohol, wine, strong beer, beer and spirits 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was a bit of an adjustment for me. Um, so there is a true gift and we have now considerable research on the value of the retail monopoly in affecting drinking and purchases of young people. Uh, Sweden has been a very good country, world leader in impaired driving, and given the frequency of young people and young adults involved in traffic crashes, uh, your level of enforcement and the blood alcohol concentration limit, which is quite low, much lower than the United States. We are not a world leader in this area, unfortunately. Uh, you have also maintained uh, higher spirits taxes than your neighboring countries. Uh, that debate of cross-border uh, transport has been frequently mentioned. Uh, but by holding your own taxes, you have had a positive effect. Uh, for some many years, uh, for the age group we're talking about, spirits was not such a great concern, and it is increasingly so now young people, particularly young adults, beginning to use in higher volumes uh, spirits. Uh, and more recently, beginning to mobilize your communities for prevention, particularly with an emphasis on uh, youth and young adults. Uh, I wouldn't say these are, this is the bad news, but at least on our, uh, as outsiders to a degree, uh, uh, observe, make some observations, what would we recommend areas of improvement? Uh, we would certainly suggest that you be able to maintain alcohol prices which account for inflation and rising personal income because of inflation and increased spending capacity. Um, is If the prices or taxes are fixed at one level, of course, the effect of those taxes on purchasing and, and alcohol abuse decays over time. And then... Uh, we are spending a great deal of attention to the issue of youth alcohol access uh, in the United States, and we feel it is important here. Uh, while you may believe that this is not a problem, uh, it is our conclusion that it should be of concern how much enforcement about the sale and providing of alcohol in private shops, bars, restaurants, clubs, um, and... Uh, social availability. Uh, if you look at the sources of data, you can see, as we are seeing, that friends and parties and unsupervised as well as supervised environments, even sponsored by parents, uh, increasing sources of availability for, for alcohol. So we are encouraging that this be given a, a more attention. So I will stop there and Tim can can Kim is, is planning to sing, so be prepared. Thank you. <laughs> good, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, come all the way from Western Canada. I've got a nine-hour jet lag problem still, but the main reason I'm tired is because I've been working with Harold Holder 
um, who's been chairing of the working group for the second report. So our youthful um, task force has got together again. I mean, you can see Harold, Sven and I are um, good representatives of the, the, the younger generation. I, I can assure you that we are young and there's proof of it because if you look at page four of our report, there's this smiling youth and the English version it says, our youth is our future. And <laughs> so anyway, Harold actually is very youthful. I couldn't keep up with him walking here from the station. He's uh, very, very youthful. So my task is to talk a little bit about some of the evidence um, behind um, the, the report and the, the conclusions, which really just are about 10 pages of text. One of our big ideas was that um, many of the interventions that work best have the strongest evidence base for the whole population work exactly the same and as effectively and sometimes more effectively with young people. So many of you will probably be aware of the larger literature summarized in such books as Alcohol No, no Ordinary Commodity, of which Harold is one of the authors. Does conclude, we've got, I'm going to talk about three um, sort of environmental policy interventions um, influencing the, price, the retail price of alcohol, um, outlet density, the number of places, convenience for buying alcohol in a, in a locality, and strategies which restrict the hours or days at which alcohol can be sold. So um, I hope this isn't, I won't be telling you all the stuff you already know, but uh, let me go through some of the basic points here. Um, though I will just point out that each one of these does have particular relevance for youth. Um, for example, um, the outlet density, the convenience, this whole issue about licensed premises. Uh, young people are often do their heavy drinking on licensed premises that more so than, you know, they occupy the, the late night drinking environment more so than older people, at least um, most of the communities I'm familiar with. Um, the trading hours, the, those who take advantage of later opening hours tend to be younger people. So strategies which target late night trading are very targeted at youth. And as I mentioned a bit later on, um, youth are highly sensitive to the effects of price. Um, they they tend to have less disposable income and they like to spend it on alcohol among other things, but um, they'd like to get um, a good value for their, for their krona when they're buying alcohol. So, think a bit about the evidence for price and taxation strategies. The, the main meta-analyses, there's, there's several of them, they all conclude that roughly um, for every 10% increase in price, there will be a 5% reduction in consumption. And that applies for heavy drinkers, and it applies for young drinkers as well. In fact, there's evidence that the price uh, young people are especially sensitive and will be um, respond to a greater degree than, than the other members of the population. Um, there's also evidence that price increases don't just reduce consumption, but they forget that whole relationship with consumption. There, there's a lot of evidence that when you change the price, measures of alcohol-related harm in the population and for youth are directly affected. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, I'll ex this figure, we don't go into this in the, in the, in the, in the report, but I like to use this figure, because where I come from, when we talk about raising the price of alcohol, everybody says it won't affect the alcoholics, it won't affect the heavy drinkers. There's, there's, you know, they will always find some way of, of substituting whatever. I like to show them this, these results from Alaska. And basically, this is um, a plot of alcohol-related... Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't quite get my spelling right. That, that's um, alcohol-related causes, uh, deaths from alcohol-related causes in, in, in Alaska. These are the number over a period of about 30 years, while the population is actually increasing. This isn't a rate. And what it shows is what happened. There's a sort of shock to those numbers of alcohol-related deaths when there's two tax increases. Um, the, the, the trend still goes upwards, but the point with this kind of time series analysis is to look at what happens where there's a sudden change. And, there's a, a, and the value of those tax um, increases decayed over time, which is another reason for the upward slope afterwards. But uh, the point I want to make here is that if, if alcoholics and heavy drinkers were not affected, and these are deaths that occur in all, uh, all ages, you wouldn't get these results. 
If they were all substituting other sources of alcohol, there wouldn't be an immediate reduction. And these, in fact, in the model are sustained reductions. That, um, but let's not go into the, the mathematical details there. Here's an example specifically on young people. Earlier this year, there was a lovely study looking at the impacts of a rather large set of tax increases in the US state of Illinois. Is that how you pronounce it? Illinois. Thank you. Um, in 2009, you can see at the bottom they are quite substantial, but US taxes on alcohol are often extraordinarily low, so I suspect these were coming up from a rather low base, um, but 80% you know, increase in the federal tax on spirits. The, the result uh, was substantial and significant reductions in rate of sexually transmitted infections, which were particularly marked among young people, and particularly um, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, well actually maybe not minorities, young Hispanic and black Americans. Um, so there's a sudden impact on a whole range of things, of harms and social behaviors, and that there's a whole variety of impacts that uh, price changes can have. Another example I'd like to give you is from our work with my team in British Columbia. We've been looking at the impact of changes to minimum prices. In, in British Columbia, the, we have a partial government monopoly, which nothing, for not, nothing to do with health and safety reasons, in order to protect their revenue, they, they don't allow prices to go down below a, a particular level for all and occasionally that minimum price gets adjusted. We looked over a number of years what happened to alcohol-related hospital admissions of different kinds. Each time, the minimum price changed, and we took account of a lot of other variables. Our model, and this was published in the American Journal of Public Health quite recently, it's open access. The, I'll stress the results for acute harm, so poisonings, injuries, which of course are predomin predominantly affecting younger people. For a 10% increase in the minimum price, we found a nearly 9% reduction, highly significant reduction of all all acute alcohol-related hospital admissions. Interestingly, it's less so for youth, but the chronic diseases responded with a lag. Several years later, there was a similar size decrease, not an immediate one, but two or three years later. Um, Cheap alcohol is particularly important as a, an alcohol policy tool, and particularly for young people. There's evidence from many countries, young drinkers seek out the cheapest alcohol. I've mentioned they're very responsive to price changes, and a beautiful study done here using system Balaget data by Harold's colleague Paul Grunewald um, was able to show that when th th there was a change in the tax and price structure of drinks in system Balaget, so I think it was in the 1990s, uh, maybe a little earlier than that, and he was able to show that the cheapest category of drinks responded the most when prices increased. Um, so it's like you can't often go below a particular floor, and it's the cheapest drinks that respond most. So there's a whole constellation of reasons why policy should focus on cheap alcohol. Um, this is a, a graph I'll explain. I kind of like it because it looks crazy. It's like spaghetti. Um, all of these different lines are depicting rates of sales of different types of alcohol in the province of Saskatchewan in, in Canada. And the, the shock, you can see that line, is the introduction of higher minimum prices across the board for all alcoholic drinks. And you don't need a statistical model to tell you that something happened when the price increase occurred. In particular, because it was applied to the higher strength beverages, there was a shift in consumption from high strength beer to lower strength beer and from higher strength wine to lower strength wines, as well as a reduction in total ethanol consumption. Um, now, if we think of price strategies in general, there is a bit of a dilemma, at least in North America. Um, good research has shown they're incredibly unpopular. I mean, alcohol is our favorite recreational drug, and most um, people who drink kind of... Actually, most people, I think, hate taxes. I mean, I think it's kind of in our DNA. We hate the government increasing the price of anything. If it's our favorite drug, we get mad. My colleague Scott McDonald showed it's even worse than that, that the higher the consumption in a community or province, the more 
anti, the more negative of people's attitudes about price increases. Now, I gather in Sweden, I, you, Swedish, Sweden is very special and different, I've found, in many ways. And I understand that Swedish people are quite accepting of, of price strategies. Um, but the kind of thing we've had to resort to in Canada, and we've made a lot of progress, is to um, have other sorts, not just saying, let's increase the price of alcohol across the board and get people mad. There's examples of pricing strategies that are, are less... I, I get less e hate emails. I get, I, I get less people phoning me up, being angry with me when I'm advocating for these things. So you set a minimum price per standard drink, per unit of alcohol. Um, higher prices for higher alcohol content drinks. Um, having prices indexed to the price of living so they don't at least get lower, they don't um, lose value over time. Another thing that voters really like, are very popular, is if you use some of the revenue from a price or tax increase for prevention or treatment purposes. So, that's enough on price. I've, I haven't got much longer. I'll say a little bit about trading hours. Um, when I'm talking about the hours, particularly after midnight usually in our society, that bars and nightclubs are open. There's quite a big literature on this, and my colleague, who's actually, I guess, the youngest member of this very youthful uh, working party, Tanya Secret Seas, we co-authored a, a review a few years back, in which we identified 49 studies from over the world about what happens if you increase or decrease the, the trade trading hours in, in, in bars. What we found was there was a very mixed um, outcome for across all of those studies, but most of the designs were terrible. They were cross-sectional studies, or they were simple before and after studies, and you can't really interpret anything um, if you just look at before and after without any control. So with minimal quality criteria, you had to have a baseline measure, follow-up, and a control comparison area or measures. We found 14 studies, 11 of which showed significant reductions um, when in, in the harm outcomes when hours of trading were reduced, or the converse, when the hours of trading went up, the harm outcomes um, uh, went up as well. And these included violence, impaired driving, and road crashes. Um, since then, well, actually, you know, the point I want to say with this slide, and it's really about my last one, these effects are surprisingly large. Even quite small changes in trading hours after midnight can have substantial impacts on either upwards or downwards. Um, Tanya Secrecies and I found in Western Australia, adding one or two hours after midnight doubled rates of assault at those premises compared with those that didn't have uh, the, the, the trading hour change. A col Australian colleague, uh, Kip Kipri, um, found a 37% reduction in assaults following a restriction of a couple of hours in late night trading for nightclubs and bars. And a wonderful study, uh, Tor Nordstrom, um, I think he's here. Yes, <laughs> um, I like quoting this study, and Ingeborg Grosso showed that a 5% reduction in assaults for each extra hour of trading. Sorry, that's the wrong way around, isn't it? A 5% increase in assaults, I beg your pardon, for each extra hour of trading in Norwegian bars compared with um, neighbourhood controls. I apologise, I didn't um, um, prepare these slides as well in advance as I should have done. But um, there's a picture of um, West, um, an island near where I live in British Columbia. And I just want to say what a pleasure it was working on this report. And um, I'm going to hand over to Sven, who will wrap things up. Thank you. Börja med slides först. Okay. Well, thanks very much for inviting me as well. Um, I'll just briefly reiterate the, the main uh, message from uh, this report, and that is basically that the strategies we use to reduce harm in the adult population largely apply to youth as well. And Harold has, uh, uh, together with Tim, gone through 
the most important points in that regard. Uh, I will focus on marketing as one component of this uh, overall message. Uh, and I would like to start just with give you a, a brief uh, example of what marketing looks like today. Uh, and this is one of the most popular uh, downloads pre presently in YouTube. And I'll see if I can find it. There we go. Nou, dit is dus de huiskamer. En dan komen we hier bij de slaapkamer. Met... Yeah, well, this is what um, we we are facing in terms of alcohol marketing. Again, the second most said, uh, viewed uh, film on YouTube right now. Um, so we need to recognize what what the market is, what's happening in the market, and and the enormous clout of the industry uh, selling alcohol. And there are some important messages from, from research in this area. One is to recognize the obvious conflict uh, in industry. Now they say that of course we don't want to encourage, encourage abusive consumption, people getting drunk and getting problems. Of course the problem is that that is where the bulk of their sales are. Young people getting intoxicated, heavy drinkers consuming alcohol who really shouldn't drink at all. And also we should expect that industry being commercial enterprises do their job, that is to promote their product and try to expand their mar markets. A dramatic example of that happened this summer. We had a wonderful summer, everybody watched football and drank a lot of beer. Marie Nygren is here and told me that we've never sold so much beer in, in System Belagadas this year. There are obvious relations here and in this case something fantastic happened in Brazil where Budweiser forced FIFA to force the Brazilian government to change their legislation. Legislation earlier forba forbid, or forbade, is that in English? <laughs> um, uh, alcohol marketing in football stadiums, or sales of alcohol in football stadiums, or around football stadiums. Now, the law was changed, so they had a Budweiser bill, uh, and then they could sell alcohol at the stadiums. Again, illustrating what enormous power these corporations have. Okay, the Swedish scene. We, we have an enormous increase in, in marketing in Sweden over the last 10, 15 years, and now exceeding a billion crowns per year. Uh, this certainly reaches young people. And, and again, my little film from YouTube is one illustration of that. Uh, in so many various ways, through TV commercials, through event sponsoring, um, promotional items, and so on. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of studies that, that support this effect, uh, and this is one very influential study from the United States uh, by Snyder and, and colleagues. Um, the greater exposure to alcohol advertising, uh, the more drinking among underage youth, and specifically, uh, for each additional ad a young person saw, he or she drank 1% more. Uh, I'm not particularly expert at, at the marketing research, uh, but it's clear to me that this is contentious. Uh, there are critics of, of the research, uh, there are n a number of methodological issues, and here's one, uh, one type of response from, from a balanced person who, who is a bit cautious, don't draw too strong uh, interpretations from, from these studies yet. Uh, so we should bear that in mind as well, that this is not a large uh, body of research. Um, having said that, just let's look at what, what do we mean by, by marketing. Uh, this is an excellent 
report from STOP, which is a uh, institute for alcohol policy in, in the Netherlands, that have looked through the European marketing scene uh, and found that there are lots of regulations. Um, many of them are statutory, that is legislation, uh, but many are also self-regulation imposed by the industry themselves. We have on the one hand content restrictions, on the other hand volume restrictions. And in this report they go through what, what is meant by either then. Uh, the problem is that the, 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 what we have mostly are content restrictions. And in fact these are not particularly strong. Uh, they use vague definitions, uh, sp saying that marketing may not be aimed specifically at minors, rather than spe specifying what, what exactly should be allowed and not allowed. Uh, so what we need is, is restrictions that, that really matter, that make these ads less appealing. Uh, volume restrictions, on the other hand, deal with where and when marketing occurs, all the way from total bans uh, to, to specific restrictions and timings. Uh, what, what the STOP report concludes is that self-regulation has over and over uh, proved not to be sufficient to really limit marketing to youth. There are a number of studies cited from different countries, the Aus Australia, the Netherlands, the UK and the US. And largely this is because uh, these self-regulation codes are written by the industry and are largely content restrictions. Again, ambiguous, open to interpretation. And it doesn't prevent young people from being exposed to large volumes of attractive alcohol advertising, like the one film we just saw. Um, so if, if these regulations are to be effective, there are a number of conditions which stop, go through and, and describe. Uh, they need to be legally binding, there should be an independent body for oversight, and meaningful, strong sanctions, um, and a simple transparent system for reporting violations. This is extremely difficult to achieve on a, on a self-regulation basis uh, and the conclusion would be that a total ban would be much more efficient if we want to protect youth from, from this type of marketing. I think I'll skip over that in, for time reasons. Uh, there was a major um, uh, enterprise uh, in the European Alcohol and Health Forum um, a couple of years back, where, where the, uh, a research group um, reviewed uh, the literature. Um, and uh, this is the result of that. They found two uh, peer-reviewed, systematic uh, uh, reviewed reviews of longitudinal studies. One by Smith and Foxcroft, which actually is a bit more guarded, but nevertheless supports um, uh, or, or finds effects on, on um, youth drinking. And the other by Peter Anderson and colleagues, which is more uh, strong in that regard. Uh, so altogether, the reviews found 13 longitudinal studies, uh, 38,000 young people aged 10 to 21, from a number of different countries, mostly from the United States. Uh, and what they conclude then, this EU <coughs> working group, is it can be concluded from the studies reviewed that alcohol marketing increases the likelihood that adolescents will start to use alcohol and to drink more if they are already using alcohol. So again, given all kinds of caveats, uh, methodologically and all that, this, th this on balance is the message. Okay, well, the Swedish situation then, it, to me, is curious, uh, and I'm sure to many others. Um, in 2002, um, uh, the journal Gourmet uh, published an ad for alcohol. Uh, the consumer ombudsman, consument ombudsman, took this to court, uh, the Stockholm District Court, uh, which felt they needed to consult the European Court of Justice. Uh, they, in turn, said, no, no, this is your decision in Sweden. Um, uh, and so the district court decided that these adverts uh, that, that a ban was too too far reaching uh, this this is a convoluted long story but uh, consumer ombudsman then appealed to the Swedish market court marknadsdomstolen and the market court finally uh, uh, rejected the appeal and upheld uh, the decision of the district court 
and here comes the punchline. In their opinion, there were other more effective measures to limit alcohol-related problems than bans against marketing. Uh, okay, so they made a scientific judgment of the present literature. Uh, well, okay, so what's happened since 2002? Well, one major event has been the Loi Evin, uh, Evin being a French parliamentarian. Um, uh, and France had this legislation uh, for many years, but in 2004 it was it was brought to the to the EU court and allowed. Uh, the EU court decided that this law was compatible with the EU treaties because it was motivated by public health. So this happened after the Swedish market court decision. Um, so. Summary, I think it's time to review uh, the, the legislation in Sweden as well now. Uh, to begin with, the market court decision in 2002 certainly was not supported by the research even at that stage. Uh, and after that, uh, a number of events have occurred, not least the loi Evin I just mentioned, but also Norway is a very illuminating example. Um, in Norway, alcohol marketing is totally banned. There, uh, it's a comprehensive uh, volume restriction, if you call it that. Um, so advertising shall be prohibited. It means any form of mass communication for the purpose of marketing, including advertisements in printed matter, films, radio, television, telephone networks, data networks, etc. All forms of mass communication. Uh, so this was extremely carefully tested in the Europe, in, first in the Norway courts, but also by the European court. So I think we have strong reasons for uh, raising this issue yet again. And of course, the bottom line being public health concerns and youth drinking. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, let's have a short session with questions uh, on this, this scientific background that we've just heard. So if Harold and, and Tim as well just can come up to the floor. Uh, we have this rather brief and uh, restricted to, to the scientific issues presented here because then we will move to the panel debate. So please, the floor is open. Anyone? Everyone is so, so impressed by your very succinct and clear presentations. So I'm sure there are some, some questions. It's too early in the morning. <laughs> and please say your, your name. <laughs> Hello, my name is Clara Hendrickson. Uh, I'm working for uh, CRM. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, since you used, I saw you used uh, the number of questions that's, that we have asking for huge problems, uh, and um, I wonder if you also have other studies where there is a, a comparison between these kind of problems uh, compared with if you had uh, had these kind of problems without alcohol, the, the number of problems, for example, for having sex without protection. Uh, I think it's relevant w if you compare it uh, with how many youth have had unprotected sex without drinking alcohol. Do you have that kind of um, background as well? Well, I think it's fair to say for most of the issues, it's not an absolute alcohol problem. The question is like starting with uh, traffic road crashes or violent events. There are many factors. So having said that, from a public health point of view and safety point of view, the question is how much more does alcohol add to the risk of that event? So 
everything we've looked at, I think, and we not only in Sweden but in all of our countries, we never. I would never say that alcohol is the single cause. And uh, I don't. Maybe the only exception to that might be alcohol poisoning, <laughs> overdose, if you will. But for the most part, those things that we're concerned with have to do with does alcohol add to it. And why does alcohol add to it? Uh, no surprise to anyone here, I'm assuming. Alcohol is a psychoactive substance. It's one of its lovely attractions. It makes us feel good in a social context uh, using it moderately, I guess, or low dose, we might say. But when you are asked to do and make good decisions, and that means not just driving an automobile, but also walking on the streets, uh, handling a relationship, being at a party, et cetera, then judgment and other decisions we have to make are impaired, and that's what the issue is for us. Uh, what we are interested in, at least I am, and I think the field is interested in, is if we start to make effective reductions on the amount of alcohol consumed, we would expect to see at least the contribution of alcohol to those problems decline, and I think there's pretty good evidence for that. Does it eliminate all unprotected sex? Obviously not. But I think the question was on your specific figures. I think they were not. Oh, I'm sorry. Risk increases, but they, were, they looked absolutely. I oh, I see. I misunderstood. Is that the question? Uh, yes, I just really followed it. Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what did you um, Just to have a quick go, there's a large literature on this. It's a very good question. It was just to illustrate that slide that there are significant levels of problems, but you're right. You can't assume that they're all caused by alcohol. But the studies which have looked at, you know, abstainers, people, uh, kids who drink one or two drinks a day, three or four drinks, there's a nice dose-response relationship with most of these kinds of problems in studies from around the world. So, yes. Okay, <laughs> any other question? Good morning. My name is Lena Harake, and I'm from the Swedish Women's uh, Organizations Committee on Alcohol and Drug Issues, and I I'm wondering how you think about the targeted marketing because we have found uh, the last uh, five, ten years that, that alcohol industry is very interested in increasing the young and even elderly women's drinking. Is there a, is this a reason for gender specific or gender sensitive strategies and policies in future? My, my response would be yes, but not based on a lot of studies on the specific outcomes uh, on gender basis. But clearly there's an increased volume of marketing directed towards women and young women in particular. Uh, I really would like to start the, the panel debate now. So I think that our uh, invited guests were introduced, but Kaisa to start. Is she here? Not yes. yet? Yes. So. Yeah, Kaisa is over there. You're yes. Kaisa Dostal mm -hmm. from the Liberal Youth Organization. Very welcome. And Ingrid Gustafsson, Linda Engström, Jonas Berg. How, how about uh, placing the scientific experts over there? And the... And the, <laughs> the yeah. <laughs> no, because there may be, be some questions to you. So, uh, let's... I think our... Uh, politicians should be invited to first address, because both Jonas and Lind, uh, Linda were in some ways involved in the report. So please, Gunvor Eriksson, uh, a few words. Uh. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I prefer to speak in Swedish, I hope it, yeah. Um, and that say, public health must go first. That's why I'm going to speak in, in Swedish. Så folkhälsan måste gå före. Jag tycker att det har varit alldeles för lite debatt i Sverige om de effekter som vi har för ungdomar. Det är jättebra att vi ser en minskad konsumtion totalt sett. Men det här som sker att vi har en ökning bland ungdomar är inte någonting som pratas om så mycket i politiken och det beklagar jag. Insikten också om att folkhälsa är en viktig ekonomisk fråga håller faktiskt på att växa fram, inte minst inom EU. 
Att minska alkoholanvändningen är ett effektivt sätt att minska de offentliga kostnaderna om man vill dra det till sin yttersta spets. Och alkoholen är nämligen en stor källa till kostnader både inom vården, skolan och rättsväsendet för att inte tala om allt mänskligt lidande. Idag har vi 200 000 barn i Sverige där minst en förälder missbrukar alkohol. Det innebär att det är två till tre barn i varje klass i skolan som inte har ett fungerande hem att gå till efter skoldagens slut. Och av den här rapporten så kan vi se att alkohol är den största orsaken till skador för unga mellan 16 och 24 år. Jag tackar verkligen för att vi får den här typen av forskningsunderlag till politiken som gör att vi också kan få upp en debatt om det. Men jag tycker att det är för lite debatt. Redan för några år sedan när folkhälsorapporten kom, när den nationella folkhälsorapporten kom, så skrev dåvarande generaldirektören för Folkhälsoinstitutet på den debatt om att de som säger nej till alkohol, den gruppen har ökat från 9 till 19 procent. Men alkoholskadorna i den här gruppen sjunker inte på samma sätt som konsumtionen. Och det tycker jag att jag saknar i den politiska debatten. Det borde vara en alarmklocka, men det är inte det. Och därför måste vi diskutera hur vi, hur vi kan påverka konsumtionen även i de riskgrupperna. Inte bara livsstilsfrågor, utan också fundera över vilka livsvillkor finns som gör att människor då utsätts eller hamnar i den här problematiken. Och det tycker jag är en folkhälsofråga som inte bara handlar om alkoholen utan det handlar också om överhuvudtaget hur vi organiserar samhället. Tack! Tack, föredömligt kort och koncist. Och eh, om du har en fråga eller kommentar specifikt till våra gäster så går det att ta på svenska. Mm. Men eh, det kanske inte... Du tyckte rapporten var bra och tydlig. Jag tycker rapporten är väldigt bra och tydlig, men jag funderar också på om man kan se något mönster i den här gruppen som då har ökade alkohol, alltså där alkoholskadorna finns. Finns det en socioekonomisk faktor i den gruppen som också råkar ut för skadorna? Okej. Okay. Question to the presentation. Is there a socioeconomic gradient? Is any group who is the most affected among the sort of marginalized groups in society? It's on. Hey, that's good. Sorry, still waking up. Um, yes, uh, but across all income groups, there's some interesting variations. One unexpected one is that actually the people who drink the most tend to be those with the highest income. But I mean, it kind of makes sense because most of us participate in drinking and the more you can afford with most things, the more you purchase. But the different patterns, it's uh, with lower income groups, you tend to get uh, more abstainers, um, but among the, those who do drink, there may, is more likely to be a, an occasional binge drinking pattern. And the harms experienced tend to be higher than, you know, liter for liter of alcohol, the harms are disproportionately experienced by people on low incomes. But the converse of that is that there's good recent research showing that when the prices go up, rather than punishing people in low-income groups, as some people fear, um, they benefit the most. The, the, the reductions in harm are the greatest. And because of harm to others from alcohol, low-income communities, which can suffer from some of the problems from alcohol, also benefit the most when some of these some would say draconian measures are, are tried. So that's my perspective. Very good, thank you very much. I think we move on. Kajsa Dovstad, you may choose language, Swedish or English. Ah, <laughs> ja, jag väljer svenska. Ja, ja. det är helt tackar du kvart. <laughs> ja, precis. Jag kommer alltså från Liberala ungdomsförbundet som är Folkpartiets ungdomsförbund. Och jag vill börja med att säga att på det här området så skiljer sig ungdomsförbundets åsikter från Folkpartiets. De är nog inte jätteglada att jag står här eh, bara några veckor innan valet. Så om ni tycker att jag säger någonting galet så eh, behöver det liksom inte vara Folkpartiets fel. <laughs> Ja, jag tycker nästan tvärtom att vi pratar lite för mycket om politik i den svenska alkoholdebatten. Vi fokuserar väldigt mycket på vad politiken ska göra för att förhindra alkoholskador när vi istället också kan prata om vad kan civilsamhället göra. 
Alkoholkonsumtionen i Sverige har gått upp de senaste 20 åren. Men vi såg en ökning till mitten på 2000-talet. Och sen har det faktiskt minskat efter det. Trots att det har skett en del liberaliseringar. Som att vi har fått ta in mer alkohol från andra EU-länder och så vidare. Och vi har också sett att trots att alkoholkonsumtionen har ökat så har faktiskt inte varken den alkoholrelaterade dödligheten eller alkoholrelaterade skador ökat i Sverige. Det behöver inte betyda att det inte finns ett samband, för det gör det. De här siffrorna hade kanske minskat om vi inte hade gjort de här liberaliseringarna. Men eh, jag vill... Eh, Läs upp här vad man sa inför att Sverige skulle gå med i EU så var det väldigt många som varnade för att det skulle ske en fördubblad alkoholkonsumtion som skulle leda till fyra gånger så många dödliga allvarliga alkoholskador. Och det har inte skett. Så att de här alarmistrapporterna är lite överdrivna, i alla fall om vi ser tillbaka på vad, vad som sades när de här liberaliseringarna skulle införas och vad som sen faktiskt hände. Och alkoholkonsumtion och alkoholrelaterat våld och alkoholrelaterad dödlighet det är också en kulturfaktor som politiken kanske inte varken kan eller kanske inte bör påverka. Så istället för att prata mycket om vad, vad politiken ska göra så tycker jag att vi kan prata om vad, vad kan vi som, eh, som människor göra. Vi till exempel att eh, UNF eh, har ett jättebra samarbete med nationerna och studentkåren i Uppsala för att försöka få ner eh, student eh, Ja, alkoholkonsumtionen bland studenter. Bara för när jag började plugga för fyra år sedan då, då gick det inte att få alkoholfria drinkar på någon nation. Nu är det flera stycken som har jättefina alkoholfria drinklistor. Så tror jag att vi måste börja tänka istället i Sverige. Istället för att bara tänka på vad ska politiken införa för förbud. Och då skulle jag också vilja eh, rikta min fråga till forskarna om det. Om det finns, för för jag, eh, i den här rapporten så stod det väldigt lite om forskning just om civilsamhällets påverkan på alkoholkonsumtionen. Så jag skulle vilja veta lite om det. Okay, questions to the researchers. What is the role of civil society? And I think you had an, också an implicit question to perhaps Harold. Why did not the Swedish entry into the union had not those dramatic effects that were foreseen. But, so, those two questions, who, who want to start? Om vi börjar med civilsamhället så kan man säga att den här rapporten söker ju vad, vad som finns i forskningen. Vad har vi vetenskapligt stöd för som fungerar? Uh, om vi vill minska negativa effekter från drickande Ja, och då har vi en rik litteratur. Det här har varit en fråga i hundratals år. Man har verkligen prövat allt från A till Ö. Inklusive den typen av initiativ på lokalsamhällsnivå, organisationer och undervisning och information och allt möjligt. Men vad som presenteras i rapporten det är ett destillat av det som visat sig ha effekt. Som faktiskt påverkat de skador som vi är intresserade av. Det är de som lyfts fram här då. Och de... Och det är en viktig slutsats och den är lite svårtuggad då. Alltså att det involverar rätt mycket av nationella insatser, beslut på politisk nivå som gör alkoholen mindre tillgänglig för ungdomar. Det är liksom the bottom line. Sen måste det understödjas med, med information för att begripliggöra det där. Och det visar sig att det är fullt möjligt. Det är just den här kombinationen av tydlig information och vassa verktyg som det handlar om. Men om vi bara skulle syssla med frivilliga insatser alltså av det slag som absolut är utmärkt, kommer vi överens med nationerna hur de ska se vid alkohol till exempel då kommer vi inte långt. Det är det som är slutsatsen av den här översikten av forskningen. Okej, okay, thank you. Uh, Harold, could you respond to the seemingly contrast between Sweden maintaining rather increasing levels of drinking, but not that much increase in harm as might have been foreseen. Let me see if I understand the question since I got confused the last time at my age. Um, the question is that because of the European Union there were... We, we had a very strong increase in consumption levels around year 2000, but not that much increase in harm as 
might have been expected. There was a point made. Well, I'm not that. sure I would agree with that. At least look what my familiar, what familiarity I have with the Swedish data is, if you use certain indicators, and the most typical one has been long-term death, right? And but if you look at acute harms, you have seen increases in acute harms. So you haven't escaped the effect. It's just not expressed in the way it's been classically done, which is long-term death. So I, if I look at the Swedish acute harm data, I would be very concerned, and I do think it's a reflection of the increase uh, that you're seeing. What you do have, though, if you compare it to what was forecast before the European Union, was really comparing uh, the absence of a retail monopoly. And the fact that you have been successful in retaining it has been a factor, a major factor in reducing the harm levels that you w would have expected, I think, otherwise. Okay, thank you. Now let's move over to uh, Linda Engström, EOGT, and you may choose language. <laughs> yes, I'll take it in Swedish, uh, since I'm not that used to using the Swedish words in English. För Jugetentio som ju är en idébriven och dri, idébru, oh, gud, här. Morgonens första ord. Idéburen och idédriven organisation som ju har en idé om vart vi vill med samhället. Um, så har ju vi när vi gör våra analyser såklart en verklighetsbild och ett samhälle. En idé om vart vi ska och sen hela tiden måste vi förhålla oss till forskningen säger om vilken väg vi ska välja. Det är ju väldigt likt så som partier jobbar. De har också en idé om vart de vill. De måste kolla på verkligheten och sen måste de välja. En väg. Och då står ganska ofta i det här läget folkhälsa mot vinstintresse och det är mellan de två man väger hur man ska förhålla sig. Vi blir ju ibland anklagade för att vara både förbudsrörelse och moralister. Eh, väldigt sällan med rätta enligt mig själv. Och då skulle jag säga så här, om vi hade en massa idéer om vart vi skulle utan forskningsstöd då är det okej okay att säga att det är moraliserande. När det finns forskningsstöd då handlar det ju bara om att man har bedömt att det är den bästa vägen att gå. Och det är den stora skillnaden. Samtidigt så tänker jag att det blir ett jättestort problem i samhället om man blir rädd för att prata om förbud och moraliserande med tanke på att vi ska utveckla samhället. Hade vi inte pratat om moraliserande frågor när vi pratar om barnaga, då hade vi fortfarande slagit våra barn som pedagogiskt verktyg. Jag är jättetacksam för att det finns folk som har varit sjukt irriterande, ställt massa krav och fått samhället att flytta sig åt en bättre riktning. Vi ska liksom inte vara rädda för det. Och det tycker jag blir väldigt snett i debatten. Um, Sen så tycker jag att det är ju såklart skönt och bekräftande att se en sån här rapport med så här oerhört etablerade forskare som visar att det som faktiskt fungerar är det som politikerna har i sin makt. Om det vore civilsamhället som skulle styra upp allt, om det var deras, om det var deras agerande som spelade roll, ja då tror jag vi hade haft en helt annan samhällsbild för att civilsamhället är betydligt mer på tårna och restriktiva om man tänker generellt sett mot i förhållande till alkoholfrågan än vad politikerna är totalt sett. Och då tycker jag att det är intressant också att kolla på tobaksfrågan och den resan. På 80-talet så, så röktes det ju hyfsat mycket, jättemycket och man gjorde massa alarmerande rapporter och trodde att vi kommer röka ihjäl oss och det kommer inte att hända. Vi kommer aldrig få stopp på det här. Och sen gjordes det ett antal saker. Man hade, ingen, man hade reklamförbud, man höjde tobaksskatten, man förbjöd rökning på restauranger och så vidare. Och nu är vi i ett helt annat läge. Och jag är helt säker på att alkoholfrågan kommer att gå samma så kallade öde, tacksamt öde, till mötes. Eh, och nu måste hela tiden prata om att vi skulle kunna se en annan verklighet än den vi ser i nu. Tack för det. Har du någon, någon specifik fråga angående rapporten? Now that would be how the... Have you looked anything into the norm of... Uh, of alcohol use and how that is affected by um, by different politics, uh, the things that the politics policy can uh, can demand, like taxes and regulation. How is that affecting the norm of how you look into a product like alcohol? A favorite question. <laughs> uh, in my country, and I'll speak to that first. Uh, the most favorite local prevention strategy is norm clarification, okay? And I will say a point blank, there is absolutely no evidence that any norms program ever had any population level effect, okay? On particularly young people's drinking and young adult. What happens in practice is 
beliefs and attitudes follow the environment, not the other way around. And that's a mistake made over and over again. In my country, it was very clear that driving drunk 30 years ago was less serious than walking drunk, okay? So we didn't enforce drinking driving. Now that's been changed because we had increased enforcement, greater punishment, then norms, quote, attitudes followed the policy change, okay? So you asked the question about norms. My experience is, and the evidence, at least working with communities, shows this over and over again, that I don't need to go into the community and change all the values in my community to be effective. I can begin to shape the environment, that is, the community can start to shape its environment, and then values and beliefs will follow that. What we do communicate, though, in an interesting way, as one of the problems with school-based education is that they, it's done in a vacuum in the sense that if the environment still is very available for alcohol, it doesn't matter what happens in the schools because if alcohol is still available, it's low cost, it's provided at home, provided by families. So I prefer to shape the environment, this is the evidence coming from the research, that these are the strategies most likely reduce. All of the evidence we have on reducing harm in this age group including up to young adults, have to do with either price or restricting availability, not norms clarification. But you do need some support to change the environment. Yes, but that don't, that's <laughs> not my, I don't need to change the entire community. Okay. I can, the opinion leaders, decision makers, I want them to be concerned about the issue. And I can use the media to make that attention, which is different than trying to get people to believe differently as a group. Does that make sense, that difference? Yeah, okay. okay. I think Kaisa has a question on this. You want to comment? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, for the last years, the, um, uh, the alcohol consumption has gone, in, has, has gone down in Sweden, both for adults and for uh, younger um, adults. Uh, uh, despite that we have not had any, of, of, uh, any harder re regulations. So I think, and, and when I was uh, uh, when, when I was um, well uh, putting a question before, uh, I, I didn't meant like information programs in school because I also think that that's very uh, a bad way to go. But uh, I meant on how we create a culture in the society, and I, I think that if if we just focus on that it's the state that should create the culture, then we are on, on a very uh, scary slippery slope. Uh, so my question is like, I, I think we should think about like why had a, a alcohol consumption in Sweden went down uh, for the last 10 or five, five years, despite that we hadn't had any harder re regulations. I find that very interesting. I'm sorry, I didn't, you hadn't had any hard evaluations? Is that what you said? Uh, uh, regulations. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, well, looking at the data I looked at, I didn't see a substantial reduction, at least in the young people. I'm looking at it, and I saw that your 17 age group, which is one of our highest drinking ages as well, has a little decline, but not a substantial decline. If you look at the self-reports in 2010 for 15-year-olds, two years later, they're now 17. And I look at 2012 for 17-year-olds, they're now drinking at a higher rate. So I'm not prepared to say that you're having a dramatic decline in your young people's drinking, first of all. Uh, I don't know what's happened in Sweden in terms of regulations. We all have gone through some economic factors that will make a difference. But I, in my country, we've had declines in consumption also, but uh, we don't have a, it's now beginning to turn and increase again. So there are other forces afoot uh, that, that are there. Your comment on, I think I understood your comment being you don't, you're uncertain about the state affecting culture. Was that? Well, that? I'm not uncertain. I, I admit that there is an effect, but I think that we're, uh, we, we cannot only talk about uh, the state, uh, the state and culture. We have to talk about other uh, no, things that fine. affect the culture as well. Well, I, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you that from a public health point of view, uh, I'll speak as a parent, I shaped the, the environment of my family because I wanted my children to be safe. 
uh, they had many beliefs and they have many values that are quite different from mine, okay? And they moved on into adulthood. So I think it's the question for every culture, how do you wish to shape the environment so that people's lives and, and safety are increased? Their le length of life is increased and safety is increased. If you wish to have more freedom, you may in some cases have more harm. But that's a cultural decision that you have to make. The cultures always go forward on their own, independent of the former regulation of your society. But it's always a question of how much enforcement you want, for example, or restriction. In Sweden, you have a retail monopoly which restricts your ability to get ab alcohol at all times, high, high volume al or high alcohol content, uh, any time of the day or night, like in my state where you get it all the time. So that's a decision you make and you gain the advantage of that. That okay. to me has changed the culture. Thank you. I think right. this is a very interesting and important debate. I think that no one of us denies the role of the civic society, as I think, I mean, that's an important basis for, for our culture, for our work. But I think what the scientific experts uh, point out and in this report is that there is strong evidence of the effect of, of, of regulations, but, but, but I think that there's a balance, and I think that, yeah, we need to move on, and I really would like to hear another part of civic society, namely the, the Swedish Society of Medicine, which is also an idea building organization in some way, also, it's not our trade union, it's really an idea building organization for, for the doctors, so please, Jonas. <laughs> yes, I'm a general practitioner, and I'm a member or representative for the society of, Swedish Society of, of Medicine, yes, yes, in the steering group of this uh, thing. And um, I found out that uh, I have not very much to do there because uh, this group is very uh, independent and uh, uh, disobedient, but anyway. Um, <coughs> Uh, I uh, sent an email to, to uh, Alebeck uh, the other day and asked if, if I should speak English or uh, Swedish, and he, he said English. Uh, that's why I had my manuscript. I knew, no, I knew you uh, spoke English so well. Uh, that's why I had my manuscript uh, through uh, Google Translate. <laughs> So if uh, I say something peculiar or wrong, it's uh, Google's fault, not mine. <laughs> uh, as I said, I, I'm a general practitioner. And I have some uh, other views of, of, of this. And uh, I mean, th this report is mostly about uh, social politics. And I meet individuals. But uh, in, in some way, we meet uh, somewhere. Um, I've been working as a doctor as, uh, over 40 years, and now I'm retired and uh, I mostly do um, education for young doctors and doctors-to-be. Uh, the reason why I'm here is, uh, I think, because in, uh, I think it was 20 years ago I started the project Riskbruksprojektet, which uh, afterwards have been distorted by the authorities, but anyway. Um, I've also been contributing to medical history by introducing the uh, term riskbruk in the 1980s. So it takes time to make change. Uh, now I'm most concerned with education in consultation skills uh, and about all, uh, about the art of talking to uh, patients about alcohol. With the everyday patients, uh, they're not seeking for alcohol problems, but they're seeking for other problems. Uh, among other things, uh, the last five, six years, I think, I've uh, been a teacher at the Karolinska Institute for the uh, nine semester medical students. And uh, we have some um, interactive seminars where uh, we try to find out uh, what the experience that they have from speaking to patients about alcohol. And uh, we come to the same result every time and uh, the same result as we get when we, we have these seminars to uh, experienced uh, GPs. They all uh, recognize the difficulty of achieving a good conversation about alcohol. 
the barriers uh, all of them identify is that alcohol as a topic is covered with the shame, guilt and taboo. Uh, the patients feel challenged or even provoked. The atmosphere in the room becomes tense. The doctor feels uncomfortable. So it's not uh, surprising if two people meet in a closed room and uh, both of them want to avoid a, a certain topic, uh, there's not much said about it. Um, so I think in general, in, in uh, health care system, um, alcohol is neglected as a cause to uh, illness and uh, injuries and so on. The question is how should we uh, the barriers uh, with moralistic overtones, uh, how can we overcome them? Uh, primarily, my profession mission is to provide the patients with objectively sustained basis for their own decisions. My uh, role is not to say what you should do or drink so or, or more or less or, or something. Uh, and as, as soon as I assume the role of interrogator or judge, I risk the good relationship, comfort and trust in the, cons uh, in the consultation is, is lost and you get nowhere. Um, in the consultation with the everyday patient, it's therefore important to have uh, facts as the main tools. Uh, that's why the, this col collaboration with uh, IOGT and NTU, uh, NTU and Svenska uh, Lekarsäskapet uh, to gather the world's most prominent researchers on alcohol to, to produce annual reports with updated, easily accessible facts on this issue. Uh, that's why it's so important because I need uh, facts uh, to uh, not, not uh, persuading my patient on anything. Uh, some brief comments on this actual report. Many of the states of youth and alcohol they are of social, political uh, uh, nature. Young people uh, are usually healthy and they have little reason to um, seek medical attention. Uh, so I don't see them so often. Uh, as I do with other patients. Uh, but the report provides a reminder to uh, mention alcohol uh, for young people, seeing me for physical injuries, for example, uh, and some other things that, that you, you have pointed out there. I miss uh, some comments about young people with psychological disorders, such as anxiety, depression, and sleep disorders, which is more and more common in our daily practice. Uh, the number of young people who um, see what Google says here, um, are treated with psychotropic drugs and tend uh, to steadily increase. Uh, a question to the research team. Do you have a, a comment on young people with minor men mental prob health problems on, and alcohol? Uh, and at last, I mu very much look forward to this year's report about moderate drinking and health benefits. Uh, myth or reality, that points out exactly what, what uh, the doctor's interest in this, and it has a great importance to the society at all. And I hope uh, that um, it will contribute uh, to a more nuanced view of risks and stereotype limits for harmful drinking. I don't know. Um, the obsession to identify the uh, individual's weekly consumption of standard drinks uh, I consider it to be counterproductive, and uh, perhaps we can have a, a change there. Okay. So uh, the question: uh, minor health, uh, mental health problems, and alcohol. Yes. Uh, my observation about that is that there's a cluster of risk factors and absence of protective factors in adolescents, which incline. So if you if you have problems in the home, problems at school, um, certain relationship problems, exposure to um, drug and alcohol availability, um, you're inclined towards having problems with drugs. There's also a range of other problems, and mental health problems are in there, conduct problems, um, truancy and, and so forth. They can cluster together in, 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 in some children. But there's a complex interaction between the substance use and the mental health problems. It's quite clear that some use of substance, excessive use of substance linked with 
you know, anxiety um, in some circumstances. Mostly it's recreation, it's using these things for fun. So the idea that it's all about treating one's negative affect isn't right. But it is the case for, for some. But the complexity comes in that usually that substance use in the longer term makes those mental health and the anxiety and depression worse. So there's some good evidence that in longitudinal studies of depression worsening as people drink heavily. So it's very complex interacting and um, Sven, I'm sure, will comment about how treatment systems need to be able to address both the mental health issues as well as the substance use issues. Having said that, many of the patients I saw with both conditions, once you've got their substance use under control, many of the mental health problems vanished or at least greatly disappeared because of that effect of fueling or stoking the level of anxiety and depression because there's a response to the drug that's dampening down those experiences. Okay, thank you very much. We have a few minutes left. So if there are any pressing questions from the audience, yes, please. One or two very, two, two very brief questions. We take both questions and then responses. Thank you. My name is Jonas Landberg and I work at CAM. And I actually have to disagree with Harold Holder's statement that the Swedish youth consumption hasn't decreased in recent years. First of all, if you, if, if you look at the slide that you had in the beginning of, of your session, you show an approximate 15% decrease in the proportion of 17-year-olds who drink. But if you look in terms of volume of consumption in the same group, it has actually gone down by 42%. So it's, it's quite a sharp decrease in terms of how much young people drink. And also th think that Kaiser had a quite relevant question that I don't believe got answered properly. That is, even though we haven't had any significant increase in price during this period, there's been a quite significant decrease in consumption. And at the end, we tried to figure out why this is. We haven't come that close to, to, to answer it, but I wonder if what other factors do you see? Because I'm not contending the fact that price is an important way of regulating youth consumption, but clearly in Sweden there must be some other factors driving this development. Okay, sorry, we have to be very brief. Yeah. Uh, last question, and then try to respond briefly to this rather complicated issue, yes? Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike. I work for uh, IOT International, so I deal a lot with uh, alcohol policy on the global level and with the uh, alcohol industries. So my question goes also to you, Kaiser. I don't think that we live in a nanny state anymore. It's the 21st century, and we live in, in a situation where the corporate consumption complex is deciding for children what, which taste they should like and for women what kind of lifestyle they should live and for young people how parties should look like. We live in a state where corporations have become nannies. So my question uh, to you is when will you as a liberal youth uh, make sure and address the corporations that limit our freedom? Thank you. <laughs> okay, that was a specific question to Kaisa, so can you... Förstod du frågan? Um, I think so. How we should uh, deal with the corporations? Well, I, I disagree that uh, it's uh, uh, that, that the corporations like always have uh, an interesting of uh, of profit, and that, that that's the factor that's um, uh, that, that makes people consume alcohol. I, I think that uh, corporations exist because uh, people. Uh, have uh, a will to con consume alcohol, uh, and uh, I, I I don't think that you should focus like too much on on the profit uh, uh, things on it. Like you should focus much on why do the peop why do people uh, drink, and uh, uh, it, that doesn't all, that 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 has more reasons than the corporations. Okay, you think the individuals shape their life, you think corporations shape our lives. That's an interesting debate. Now, has drinking among youth declined or not in Sweden? <laughs> Who can respond? Sven? Well, I, I think we need to recognize what happened in the early 2000s. There was enormous concern about the increased drinking in Sweden. And what happened was we had national alcohol policy plans or alcohol action plans. Uh, 
five years plus five years. And to me, that represented something internationally unique, uh, enormous investment in prevention. Uh, what was created was an infrastructure for prevention with local and regional drug coordinators. A lot of money got funneled into various programs. Responsible beverage service was disseminated all over the country. Every municipality started training servers in that. Riskbruksprojektet uh, got disseminated into every county council in Sweden. Uh, doctors, nurses were trained in this. Whether it was successful, we can discuss. But, but it was enormous effort to mobilize uh, agencies, committees, local corporations, NGOs, on a scale that we've not seen before. And I, I, I think it, one should have that in mind when discussing what happened. Uh, during the following 10 years, okay. because what we saw from 2004 was a decline in, in consumption in Sweden, uh, which has been reversed, by the way, the last year, so nothing lasts forever. Okay, thank you. We were skillful in mitigating the effects. So we are really now over time, so please, I give the last word to Gunnar Eriksson, our politicians need to shape our future, not the <laughs> yeah. corporations, the politicians. I think that the consumption has gone down, yes, but not the injuries. And that's what we have to address the politicians. <clears throat> It was a little book gave, given to every parent that told the parents you should not get alcohol to, to the youth. I think it has been um, very good that nowadays it's not so common that you give alcohol to the youth under 18 years. So the politicians' decisions is important and we have to work together with the civil society yeah. but you can't um, um, make uh, to not to listen to the society that have the evidence. We politicians have to have the evidence on the table and then it's a political decision what we want to do with the evidence. Okay, thank so, you very much. Uh, I th did I interrupt you? I'm sorry. <laughs> so for me it's a politi political issue that what do we want for the future and it's your show's choice. Thank you. We will all help uh, shaping the future and I think it's both the role of cooperation, individual society and our good scientists that also lay the ground for this. Thank you very much for this very interesting debate.